Let's pray together. There are a few things, Lord, that steady our feet and lift our drooping hands and strengthen our weak knees more than to know that you catch us when we're falling and tell us who we are. We are yours. So if any listening to me now feels fragile and about to stumble and collapse, would you put arms, powerful, divine, gracious arms under them by your word and spirit and tell them who they are, or better, whose they are. And so, make us strong now, I pray, in this service. Not in our own strength. We're not eager to show our strength. We're eager to be strong in the strength of the Lord so that your power is made perfect in our weakness. To that end, help me to be a faithful minister of the Word in these next moments, I pray. Lord, we're tackling a, an issue of tension tonight in the world not of the world conformed no but at home some Lord it is not an easy verse and the Christian life is a supernatural life and therefore we need supernatural transformation to prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So come and help me to do my part while you work through me and in spite of me to bless and strengthen and guide and refine and purify and transform your people. Through Christ I pray, amen. Oh, how many questions this verse 2 of Romans 12 raises for us. How does the command do not be conformed to this world relate to Paul's practice expressed, for example, in 1 Corinthians 9.22 I become all things to all men, if by all means I might win some. How does not being conformed to the world fit with, I become all things to all people, if by any means I might save them? How does the command, don't be conformed to this world, fit with 1 Corinthians 10.32, where Paul says, Give no offense to Jew or to Greek or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. How does not being conformed to the world fit with, I try to please everybody? There's some tension here. You can't please everybody if you don't conform to what they think and what they do. What I want to do tonight and this morning is to draw your attention to some categories of thinking about how to manage these tensions in the Bible. I want to try to give us a way to think about don't be conformed and yet become all things to all people. We need some structures in our mind about how to think about these tensions 
in the New Testament. So that's my, my aim. And my hope is that in providing these biblical structures of thought, um, your mind would be transformed so that you are more able to prove by testing what is the will of God. We're going to be on this verse for at least three weeks. There's a lot to do here. And tonight, today, is the big picture of the tension between being conformed to the world and not being conformed to the world. Now, the reason Paul uh, speaks in these tensions is not because he gets confused and loses track of what it means to be a Christian in a fallen world. Like sometimes he thinks it's conformity and sometimes he thinks it's not conformity and he really doesn't know what he thinks. He's just very mixed up and so sometimes he says the one and sometimes he says the other. That's not what's going on here. There's something very deep going on here. Namely, Paul is holding in balance two impulses two principles that are rooted very deeply in the essence of Christianity. And I want to describe the tension, the two impulses that seem to knock heads with each other, and then I want to describe what I see as four roots in Christianity of where that tension comes from, and then back up and draw things together and tell you where we're going from there in the coming weeks. These two impulses can be given different names. I'm going to use, to start with, names that I got from this book. This is called The Missionary Movement in Christian History, Studies in the Transmission of Faith by Andrew Walls, who used to teach at the University of Edinburgh. The essays I've read in here, it's a collection of essays, have been tremendously helpful to me. And this is one of them. He argues that in Christianity there are rooted two impulses, two principles. And he gives them these names, and we'll try to find some other names. The indigenous or indigenizing impulse and the pilgrim impulse. And he says that both of them are absolutely crucial absolutely rooted in the gospel, indigenous at home, the gospel can and must be at home in every culture on planet earth. It must be indigenous. It must make its way into new cultures over and over again and put them on like a garment and wear them with a sense of at-homeness. And the gospel must be a pilgrim impulse so that as a culture puts on the gospel, wears it as good news, feels at home in it, suddenly that culture discovers the gospel indicts, criticizes, corrects, changes, and turns people into pilgrims and sojourners and aliens and refugees and exiles on planet Earth, no longer feeling at home in their culture anymore. And you can feel the tension banging up against each other as you say, well, which is it? Am I supposed to be at home in my culture and wear the gospel in a comfortable way? Or is the gospel supposed to put me out of sync with my culture so that I am an alien and a pilgrim on planet Earth? Which is it? And his argument is, and I'm going to argue that it's thoroughly biblical, that both impulses are rooted in in the very nature of Christianity, the nature of Christ, the nature of the kingdom, the nature of creation, the nature of salvation. And we are called to find the biblical balance. So if you wondered why verse 2 says, 
You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove by testing what is the will of God instead of just saying, read the Bible, it tells you what to do. If you wondered why there has to be this transformation talk, this think talk, this discernment talk, it's because these two impulses are woven into the ethic the morality of the Bible, and they do not often feel compatible. And it takes discernment. It takes a spiritual sensitivity that is very unnatural to come by to discern and navigate our way through the excessive indigenousness and excessive pilgrim mentality. And Christians are always in tension. I'll just tell you right now, in this church, right now, these two impulses are banging against each other on the Council of Elders big time. Right, guys? They'll know what I'm talking about. We spare you a lot of mess, folks. Not all of it. The impulse of pilgrim we're counterculture in this church. We don't do it like the world does it. And we're indigenous. We're going to get into every culture. We're going to make sure every culture can wear this thing called the gospel. Put those together. And you'll wonder why we stay here till midnight, week after week. This is no easy task for any family to figure out or any eldership to work on to lead a people and navigate between indigenousness in American multicultural situations and pilgrim, alien, refugee, free, countercultural. That is not easy. And that's where this verse takes us. And I want to just talk about the big picture of what that is. What does it look like? Where does it get rooted? So let's try that. There are a lot of ways to describe this tension. Let me give you several. One is to say that we are not in the world. I'm sorry. We are not of the world, but we are in the world. That comes from John 17, verses 15 and 16. Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So there you have it in two verses. Jesus and his followers are in the world. Don't take them out. The world will perish. They are salt. They are light. Keep them there with all its mess and all of its confusion and all of its uncertainties at work, at play. Keep them there. But don't let them be shaped by the devil. And don't let them be of the world. Indigenous, we are in the world. Not of the world, pilgrim. So there are the two impulses in biblical language. Here's a second way of describing it. This way accounts for huge divisions in the church itself. You think you have divisions in your family or in your, your friends, your small group, or this church as it tries to slog its way through these issues? Whole denominations form around emphases. We are taught in the Bible to be, keyword, separate from the world. There is a real doctrine of separation in the Bible. And that has marked fundamentalism for generations. And we may praise God for that emphasis. There is another emphasis. Not just separation, but participation. And that's in the Bible. Just as clearly... 2 Corinthians 6.17 Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. That's the pilgrim principle. But then he balances it with 1 Corinthians 
I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral in the world, since then you would have to go out of the world. He assumes everybody's sexually immoral. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality. There is a holy ostracism that goes with church discipline when professing Christians flagrantly live lifestyles that contradict the gospel. But hobnobbing with unbelievers who sleep around is what we're called to do. Separation, participation. Yes. Here's the third way to describe it. Adaptation or confrontation. Here's the verses for that. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, Paul says, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. What's that mean? That means adapt. Fit in. Don't make waves. Be liked by your unbelieving neighbor. Colleagues. This word properly is interesting. Live properly. Yusuke manos. It has to do with what's perceived as fitting. So I, I probably shouldn't preach in knickers. It would just be weird, you know? This is weird enough, right? But it doesn't say in the Bible, don't preach in knickers. It just says, live properly. And you've got to have your mind transformed to figure these things out. And you may wonder why certain things are done in the church. And it may be because our minds aren't transformed enough, or it may be because they are. And that's the judgment call we've made. So those are three ways of describing Oh, I didn't finish that one, did I? I just gave you the adaptation part. Here's the confrontation part. Ephesians 5, 6. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. Whoa. <laughs> How's that fitting in, Paul? How's that not making waves when you expose the fruitful works of darkness? You preach on them and you write articles in the Tribune and you lead a campaign. How's that work, Paul? Just kind of fit in, don't make waves, do what's proper. Do not participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but expose them. So there are three ways. Adaptation and confrontation. Participation, separation. In the world, not of the world. Do not be conformed. I become all things to all men. Be indigenous. Be a pilgrim. There they are. It's all over the Bible. This tension. The question is, navigating it. Navigating it so that we don't fall off the cliff of excessive indigenousness, which is where I think the American church is going, or excessive pilgrim. So you can't even touch the world, you're so weird. It's a lot of wisdom, doesn't it? So... We need, I think, first of all, to answer this question. Where does that tension come from? What are the roots of it? Because once you catch on to the roots of it, I think you'll have a better sense how to navigate 
and what each one is for, why there's a pilgrim principle, and why there's an indig indigenous principle. So let me talk about four roots. These are very easy to see. They all, well, you'll hear how they sound. It's because of the unique Christian understanding of creation, the unique Christian understanding of Christ, the unique Christian understanding of conversion, and the unique Christian understanding of the kingdom. Let's talk about those four roots, and you'll see immediately why this tension emerges in, in Christianity. First, the indigenous pilgrim tension is rooted in creation, the, the Christian view of creation. Paul was dealing in Corinth, for example, with a culture in which meat was offered to idols and then hung up in the marketplace for sale to, to eat. What should a Christian do? What does a pilgrim do? What does an indigenous person do? Listen to his conclusion and what he bases it on. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 25 and 26. Eat whatever is sold in the market without asking any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what is he rooting the freedom of the Christian in? He's rooting it in creation. I made that meat. That's my meat. You own it as my meat. Eat it as my meat. Worship is my meat. I don't care who it was offered to when it was killed. It's my meat. I made it. You get a profound doctrine of creation, and you're free. And so, the earth is the Lord's, and no, no religion can co-opt meat and reality. No religion can morally contaminate meat. It's God's. And his ownership frees us to eat it. But that's not the only thing the Bible says about creation, is it? For example, Romans 8.20, the creation was subjected to futility. The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Creation is not only God's, it's fallen. It's broken. It needs redemption. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.31, the present form of this world is passing away. Hmm. So now you have creation functioning in our ethics as it's mine. Do with it whatever you please as my child. And then you have it's broken and it's passing away. Be careful. Now when Paul takes that truth of its need for redemption and its brokenness and applies it to meat, listen to what happens. This comes from 1 Corinthians 6.13, where he's addressing some overly indigenous Corinthians. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. I think that's what they're saying. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And Paul responds, true enough, and God will destroy both the one and the other. In other words, don't absolutize creation. Don't absolutize appetite. Don't absolutize God's ownership as though that's the only truth that matters when it comes to meat, stuff, things in the world. We should function, we should navigate with things by saying, my Father owns this world. I am an heir of my father, therefore I have ownership as well, and I may legitimately exploit and use this world for the benefit of my family and my church. Yes, say that, 
and then say also and I will not absolutize that right but I will always have a view to how creation now is becoming redeemed and must be thought of in terms of God's redemptive purposes and not just his creation purposes very one concrete example if you just took God's creative purposes you'd say everybody should be married because in the order of creation it says it's not good for man to be alone it's not good Genesis 2.18 pre-fall creation ordinance everybody get married it's bad to be alone boy but you get to 1 Corinthians 7 where redemption comes into the picture and Paul says I'm so glad I'm single I'd kill a wife dragging her around the way God drags me around and I hope many of you will stay single he said well, don't you think Moses would get bent out of shape? Hey, I said it's not good for a man to be alone. And you're saying singleness is all great? He says, yeah, because there are other truths going on here. We're not in paradise. Here's the second root of the tension between pilgrim and indigenous the Christian view of Christ. The first was creation. The second is Christ. This is very simple. Everybody can see this. Jesus Christ became a human being. That's the indigenous principle. He became a human being. He took it on. He wore our nature. He wore our flesh. He wore our weakness. He was tempted in every point like we are. He was like us. That's the indigenous principle. And oh, how he came to his own, and his own received him not. We killed him. Why did we kill him? He was one of us. We killed him because of the pilgrim principle that he had, as well as the indigenous principle. He was different. He was absolutely committed to authenticity and righteousness and purity and holiness and love and sacrifice and mercy. And the people who didn't have those kinds of commitments were way out of step with him or he with them. He was a pilgrim on planet earth while he wore our flesh. And so the indigenous principle and the pilgrim principle are manifestly rooted in Jesus Christ. He becomes incarnate to reach us and he stays out of step with us to die for us to reach us. It took both. And you know what? It will take both to reach every culture on planet earth. And oh, I love missionaries. They have the hardest job of all. Here we are. We wear American culture just like it was yesterday, you know. We don't even give a thought what we put on in the morning. We don't give a thought. Cars and everything. I mean, we are totally American. And therefore, it's really good to have verse 2 telling us, don't be conformed to this world. But we, we put on America a long time ago, hundreds of years ago. Missionaries leave this. And they go to another planet. And they have to learn a language, customs, endless. Stay there long enough, 10, 15, 20 years, that they might begin to be natural, go with the flow, and try not to get themselves killed in the process, which some of them will be killed. Because they go both as indigenous, loving the people, longing to adapt, not wanting to give offense, Bring in Jesus, who always gives offense. Third root. First was creation, second was Christ, and now conversion. This is justification and sanctification. Indigenous to heaven and on our way to heaven. Let's read. Romans 3.28, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Oh, this is good news. This is six years worth of good news at Bethlehem. In the moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the first mustard seed of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior and treasure, God reckons you righteous in His sight. Completely, totally on the basis of Christ's righteousness, not yours, and you are immediately made, or let us say, counted indigenous to heaven. Immediately indigenous to heaven. And then, after that glorious good news, comes the second part of the good news, not bad news, that now the Holy Spirit has moved in. And He knows we're not fit for heaven. <laughs> we fit for heaven. He knows we're not fit for heaven. He's counting us as fit for heaven. He's going to get us to heaven. He's totally committed to His covenant kids. And now He says, become what you are. Get on the pilgrim road. I have made you righteous in Jesus Christ. Become righteous by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit, by trusting in the promises, and we grow up into Christ so that we are more fit for heaven in the future than we are now. Little by little, we are being transformed into the image of Christ. So, conversion, justification, in the, mean, in, in the twinkling of an eye, at the first act of faith, we are counted righteous, and then the process of sanctification is the indigenous principle. Apply that to a culture. You walk in as a missionary, and you say, I bless you. I'm here to bless you. Polygamy, wife burning, bribery. I bless you. I'm here with good news. Jesus Christ died so that everyone who merely believes will be made indigenous for heaven and live forever with eternal joy in heaven. Knowing all the while, this has got to change. <laughs> Polygamy is not in the Bible. It's not God's original will. Bribery should stop. Wife burning, that's got to go early. you did. William Carey made a name for himself by saying that will not be tolerated early on. It didn't take 50 years to sanctify that part of the culture, but it might take a generation or two to sanctify polygamy. And the judgment calls about how that's done, I'm not going to get down on missionaries on that. I'm saying we know it's not biblical, we know it's not the way to go, but who of you would cast the first stone? Anybody without sin here on your way to perfect heaven? So we're going to move that culture just like we're going to move ourselves on the pilgrim road. Lastly, there is a fourth route. Oh, I see a verse here. I want to make sure you get this one because this, this is such a good, a good verse on the way conversion is the root of indigenous and pilgrim. It's Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ, that's the indigenous principle, indigenous to heaven. If you've been raised with Christ, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. That's the pilgrim principle. Okay. Finally, number four, the kingdom the indigenous pilgrim tension is rooted in the Christian understanding of the kingdom. We heard this on Wednesday night. Luke eleven twenty. If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So here you got the whole Jewish people waiting, longing, yearning for the kingdom of God. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, if my finger casts out demons, the kingdom is here. I'm the king. It's here. That's the mystery of the gospel. The kingdom has come. Or the one that Chris read Wednesday, Luke 17, 21. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So one side of the truth, namely the indigenous side, is 
The kingdom's here. It's arrived. We're in the kingdom. We have a king. And then, then there's the other side of the truth, namely Luke twenty two eighteen. 18. At the Last Supper, Jesus says, I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the vine, of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. It's not here yet. It is here in Christ. It is here in large measures of fulfillment of Old Testament promise, but it is not here in consummation. And therefore, as many of you have learned in reading good, responsible New Testament theology books, and the rest of you learned it by just reading the Bible, this age, which is fallen, and the age to come, the kingdom age, overlap, and we live in that overlapping, and we're torn. We know we're citizens of planet Earth. We know we've got to deal politically with the issue of homosexuality. And we know we're citizens of heaven. It's over. We're home. We know what's right. We don't want anything to do with that stuff. We went out of here because we're not at home here. And Martin Luther developed a whole two-kingdom theology, which was very helpful. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's and deal with the tension. And understand, there will always be Democrats and Republicans. Christians on both sides. Though it is becoming harder, I think. Okay, let me try to wrap things up. Yes, confrontation of the world. Yes, missionary adaptation to the world. Yes, separation from the world. But also, yes, cultural participation in the world. Yes, in the world, but no, not of the world. Yes, becoming all things to all people that we might win some, but no, not conformed to the world. Yes to indigenousness and yes to pilgrim mindset. Why? Because creation is the Lord's and creation is fallen and in need of redemption. Why? Because Christ is incarnate, one of us, and Christ was crucified. Why? Because conversion is justification by faith alone and sanctification by faith alone. We are counted righteous already and we must become what God counts us to be. Why? Because the kingdom is already here in tremendous power in salvation, but it is not yet consummated. That will happen at the second coming. How then will we navigate these waters? The answer, spend two or three years on Romans 12 to 15. Because the reason he didn't just stop after verse 2, verses 2 is all he has to say. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and prove what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's all you've got to do. So quit writing. And he knows that the way the mind gets transformed is with divinely inspired illustrations of how to deal with your enemies, how to deal with the church, how to deal with the state, chapter 13, how to deal with issues of Weak brethren in the church, chapter 14. How to deal with missions, chapter 15. He knows one of the ways our minds get transformed by the Spirit is by divinely inspired 
illustrations of navigation through the world. So we're going to be here because I want to be this kind of person. I want to know how to navigate my way in American culture. I want people like Joe Stark there as he goes to Uzbekistan to have a, a profound ability because of the transformation of his mind to navigate the increasingly difficult waters of Uzbekistan. If it's hard here, it'd be harder there. So in the meantime, here's where we're going. When I get back from vacation, it starts Thursday, I'm going to tackle homosexuality and the marriage amendment. Because the word dokimazo, that's a Greek word, in verse 2, occurs in chapter 1, verse 26, dealing with homosexuality. There's no artificial connection to be made here at all. It is riveted. There is an unbelievably close connection between what Paul has to say about homosexuality in chapter 1. They did not dokimazo to have God in their knowledge. They did not approve, prove to have God in their knowledge, mind transformed. And therefore, he gave them over to depravity. And the whole political dimension of it, an amendment in the Constitution, how does that fit in? You've got two issues, a big moral issue, a lifestyle issue, a big political issue and strategy issue. We've got to navigate these waters. We cannot bury ourselves in American culture, nor can we assume that every bandwagon that comes along is one we should jump on, right wing or left wing. We are free people. We are pilgrims. We assess right. We assess left. Sometimes we lean this way. Sometimes we lean that way. Because we're keying off one king. It is not Bush. It is not Kerry. It is Christ. That's our king. And if I have to go to jail for preaching that homosexuality is an abomination, I'll go to jail. By the way, there's a table out there, I think, tonight, and there will be tomorrow morning, with information about that whole political issue. So go there for more information. So in the meantime, here's my how-to ending exhortation. One, saturate your mind with the Bible. Saturate your mind with the Bible. Two, Ask the Lord for wisdom. Does any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask the Lord. Third, look steadfastly every day to Jesus Christ. Because Paul says that in beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed, transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Father, I beg of you that you would give me as a preaching pastor here and 25 elders and other staff supernatural help in navigating the waters of the pilgrim indigenous principal tension for this church. I beg of you. Publicly, I ask. We are needy as elders. We're needy. This Tuesday night, we're getting together. And these kinds of things will be paramount. And then do it for families. Do it for single people. Do it for the old who have their own issues. And do it for the children who have their issues. What TV programs are appropriate and how do you relate to unbelieving friend down the street? These are issues for everybody and I pray that you will help us, O oh God. You are the potter and we are the clay and we want to be conformed utterly to you and therefore we need you to shape us. Be our vision, O oh God. You are our only hope. So shape us like a potter, be our vision like a treasure, and make us now able to discern your will. Through Christ I pray. 
Amen.